Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kanedu, and I'll be presenting my EA per capstone project on assessing federal tribal consultation policy for lithium mine permitting. So I'm a third year JD MS in the EIPER program, and my advisor for this project was Professor Debbie Sevis in the law school. Um, a little bit about me, my family is from Ghana, and so growing up between here and there, um, I've kind of always been interested in resource curse, um, resources being located in the global south and benefits accruing to the global north, and so that kind of helps motivate this project. And so today I wanna to start with the human impact of the clean energy transition. And I wanted to ask um, who here is pro electric vehicles? Who likes electric vehicles? Yeah, don't be shy. We just had a presentation on electric vehicles, um, which is great, but electric vehicle batteries do require lithium and lithium has to be mined. And so in the United States, as we are sort of increasing EV sales and pushing that as part of our net zero plan, and also increasing domestic mining, it's important to note that 79% of US lithium reserves are located within 35 miles of a Native American reservation. And that's not even counting any non-reservation land that would also in impact indigenous people. So that means this sort of push towards more lithium mining is going to disproportionately impact um, indigenous people. And so the problem with this is that we are in danger of repeating the exploitation, dispossession, and inequities of the fossil fuel paradigm in our transition to a clean energy economy. And I do want to make clear that the Biden administration is aware of this. There are tons of executive orders, interagency working groups, um, reports, policies coming out about this issue. Um, but I think this quote sort of demonstrates the fact that Although there are new executive orders, new policies for many tribes, um, they see the situation on the ground as business as usual. Um, many of them still do not have a seat at the table in terms of deciding where this mining takes place and how. And so that leads me to my product deliverable. And a motivating quote for this project in this presentation is the fact that um, substantive changes to the law can be good without being adequate. And someone said that to me. Um, who I interviewed for this project, and I, I really think that's very poignant. And so I hope to sort of address that with my deliverable, which is a policy brief that um, will address three points. So first, looking at the culture and context of tribal land in the US and the relationship between tribes and the current administration. Second, addressing that tribal consultation at present is ineffective, and third, um, the fact that we need to imagine more than consultation with tribes, we need to imagine consent. And the sort of gold standard globally for consent is free and prior informed consent, or FPIC, which upholds the sovereignty and self-determination of indigenous peoples while protecting indigenous lands and resources. And so this leads me to my methods, which were a review of the laws and policies around this issue, and then I also conducted 15 semi-structured interviews with stakeholders. And so there are a ton of laws that are relevant to the mining process, but the two ones that I sort of found to be most influential were the 1872 General Mining Law, which declares all valuable mineral deposits on federal land to be free and open to exploration, and then also the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which is what puts in place this consultation requirement for projects on federal land, but it just says federal agencies must consider the effect on historic properties. And so the link I see between the research I just described in terms of laws and policies and the field work is that um, the law and policy initiatives that I looked at recognize but do not fully address the conflicts on the ground that I observed. And so this leads me to my findings. Um, so the issues identified by stakeholders. One overarching finding um, amongst the stakeholders I spoke with is that they actually all agreed that the 1872 general mining law needs to be reformed and that local Bureau of Land Management policy um, across local offices should be standardized, but their reasons for feeling this way varied broadly. Um, so one of the biggest issues I identified related to these reforms is the fact that um, tribal participation is necessary at all phases of a mine project, 
not just during Section 106 consultation. And I think this quote from one of the tribal representatives I spoke with um, kind of demonstrates that. So for her, true meaningful consultation would be as soon as a mining company submitted a project proposal, sitting down, involving the tribes at that point and um, having them be a part of the line drawing versus submitting the plan of operations, um, having these conversations with the agencies and then only involving tribes later on. Another big issue identified was the lack of resources and institutional knowledge within the local Bureau of Land Management offices, which can cause issues with tribes. Um, and after speaking with a former Bureau of Land Management field office manager, um, what he kind of said was that over time, there has been a lack of training. There are people who don't really understand how to be effective in this environment of consultation with tribes and they don't really understand how to build relationships with the tribes. Um, there's also a lot of turnover in these agencies and so that causes issues in, in the consultation process. And then the last big issue identified was the, that the role of the Bureau of Land Management as gatekeeper of tribal cultural heritage can be problematic. Um, and this quote from a representative of a lithium mining company I spoke with demonstrates that. Um, in his experience, the mining company does not get to see the consultation report or be a part of the consultation process. It's strictly between the agency and the tribe. Um, and so they basically invest this capital um, and don't know if there is an issue in terms of the tribe's cultural or um, cultural heritage until it bubbles up way later in the process. Um, and so those findings kind of led me to my theory of change. And so the findings I described, you can kind of see relating to the inputs here, um, the lack of training, um, maybe not the best recruiting within these local agencies. So an input would be agency training and recruiting programs, having tribal input on policy, which would lead to better retention and transparency leading to policy change, improving compliance with existing policy, regulatory change, and then the ultimate impact is early and robust consultation, um, which is great, but it also leads me back to that quote I said would motivate this talk, which is that um, you can have changes to law that are good but not adequate, and so a more transformative impact would be free and prior informed consent. Um, so as you can see, the inputs here are not necessarily legal, um, or bureaucratic. These have to do with political activism, demanding corporate accountability, changing consumption, trans um, leading to transformation of business models, a change in policy priorities, um, legislative reform, and ultimately free and prior informed consent. And so um, for my impact and conclusion, I think this project has highlighted gaps and disagreements among stakeholders in what's a growing domestic lithium mining ecosystem. And I think this can be a policy or the start of a policy tool for new rules and eventual legal reforms. It is important to note that each tribe, project, and agency office is different. So I spoke mostly with people in Nevada. Um, these are, this is not necessarily generalizable um, to these different groups. Um, one person I spoke to said, this quote, mining has to happen somewhere, but I want to make clear with this presentation that this does not mean it needs to negatively impact tribes. Um, and then lastly, the law is a limited and retroactive tool, so it's important to utilize other tools like corporate accountability and education um, to get to that more transformative impact of free and prior informed consent. Thank you. Uh, that's my <laughs> Carly. Thank you for presenting. I'm wondering, especially when you're talking to tribal representatives, mm -hmm. what's their take on the EV transition? Because, oh. like, I can imagine people thinking, well, not only is this impacting our land, but we're not driving EVs anyway. Right. Um, I think. For the, so I spoke to two different tribes in Nevada, and I think for them, they don't see EVs as this like fixed 
all the way that it's kind of being touted in some of the policies that we're seeing. Um, and so for them, they, they're not necessarily against mining completely, um, but compared to say the EU, why isn't there a focus on recycling as a source of a lot of these minerals? Um, there are some benefits to tribes like under the IRA in terms of taking advantage of these clean um, vehicle tax credits. Um, but for some of the tribal representatives I spoke with, it's like in terms of hum it's capital, human capital, there's not that many resources to go out and apply for this federal funding. Um, in addition to receiving letters almost daily from the federal government for consultation for different types of projects and different agencies. So it's not that you know these policies don't do anything, but I think there's a misunderstanding of you know how daily life for at least the tribes I spoke to actually works um, and how these benefits act would eventually trickle down to these communities. Um, yeah, and then I think one other thing uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer told me is just that they feel as if the federal government sometimes takes advantage of the poverty of many tribes. And so it's good and well to offer these benefits. Um, but, you know, can you really consent to that when you are, when you really have no choice, basically? Yeah, really great presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, so one question is, you know, I, I really like this thing you brought up about BLM and the history of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question is, uh, to what extent are like kind of native people staffers within BLM, and like are there pathways for uh, to kind of increase representation in leadership in BLM, given the need that you very eloquently described to do better kind of. Uh, collaboration with communities. Yeah, so I don't want to speak for any tribes across the board. I think I can give you examples of some things that people have said to me. And so in my different interviews, even with mining companies, a lot of them have indigenous people um, working with them as their like, liaison with tribes, as consultants, things like that. But I think it's important to note that each tribe is a sovereign, each federally recognized tribe is a sovereign nation. And so there's really no, I guess, like one size fits all. So I, I do think representation is important, but that doesn't mean that each tribal council, that's going to help each separate tribal council for each um, tribe. So I think that's one sort of point. And I, I do also think for, for one tribe I spoke to in Nevada, um, they feel as if um, some some people in, in federal government, at least, who are indigenous are kind of there to appease them. Um, and it, they haven't noticed a change in terms of them getting more respect in the consultation process. Um, so again, don't, don't want to generalize, but that is just what people have said to me that in my interviews, yeah. Great. So um, the uh, I haven't seen you since the last week. The, uh, we had the uh, White House lead on domestic climate policy uh, speaker on Monday. So he's kind of the point man from IRA. So I would suggest for all of you working on this, particularly the, the uh, tribal lands there. So th their big pitch. This is kind of marketing. His job now I think is marketing the IRA. It's people, places, and projects mm -hmm. to try to get hardware on the ground and show people there are actually going to be some benefits. One of the examples he gave, which was very personal to him, is he is a, uh, his parents emigrated from Pakistan when he was in sixth grade, and he remembers all too well growing up in Erie, Pennsylvania, and taking the, the, uh, the old yellow school buses with the diesel exhaust that blows in your face, whether you're on the bus or not. And he <laughs> said he took particular pleasure in one of the projects they've already done, which was on Indian lands, I think it was in New Mexico, where they've actually uh, mega subsidized a bunch of electric school buses. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't give up on that. It, you know, it's always hard to do these things, but there may be an opportunity in that kind of frame to do some new things more quickly than you might have imagined even two weeks ago. Yeah. Or recently. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very. It's really interesting. I think 
yeah, it's tough because I think, uh, you know, improved transportation, especially clean transportation is helpful, but it's not necessarily like a trade, an equal trade for let's, you know, permit this mine in this place where like this massacre happened or where the, these resources are impacted. So I definitely think tribes, of course, should be able to benefit from, from for example, the IRA. Um, but I think sort of what I got from my project is the participation is so important, um, not just in implementing the laws, but making the laws and, and thinking about um, you know who they're going to impact. Totally. Yeah, you can combine forces with the Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.